Well, since we're not able to meet in class today, I thought I'd prepare a couple notes of the things I was going to say about uh, simple harmonic motion. Uh, the SHM, as you recall, has to do, uh, as we've studied it so far, uh, with a spring mass system where we imagine a, uh, a mass bobbing back and forth about some equilibrium position. Uh, the key elements uh, out of this was when we applied F equals MA, uh, what was critical was that the restoring force was proportional to the displacement and of course was in the opposite direction. And uh, when we combine that with the Newton's second law, uh, is how we came about uh, discovering a differential equation that looked like this. And that led us to ask the $64 question, gee, what is it we differentiate twice and, uh, and get the uh, uh, same function back again? and concluded that it was a linear combination of sines and cosines and we chose for convenience sake to write that as uh, x is equal to some amplitude times a cosine function of omega t uh, perhaps with the addition of a phase angle. After we had that uh, we took a couple of derivatives uh, the dx uh, dt was um, <clears throat> minus a omega sine omega t plus phi and when we took the second derivative we brought down another factor of omega and we're back as expected to our cosine function. <clears throat> the point is that uh, when we compared uh, this expression uh, for the second derivative uh, with our expression up here we found that that uh, omega squared constant was identified with k over m and that's, well let's see, we could write that uh, this way as uh, minus omega squared and a cosine is our original function back again and that's how we began to associate omega squared with the k over m and got our omega as the square root of k over m. And you've had a chance to play around with that expression and indeed all of these expressions in the homework in order to uh, uh, become familiar with the concepts of the period and the frequency, the angular frequency and so forth. Uh, <coughs> what we need to do ne next is to, um, is to expand this to another application where instead of looking at a, a mass uh, connected to a spring, we want to see the same kind of thing occur when we look at the motion of a pendulum. So, <coughs> uh, to that end, let's get this out of here. and look at the, uh, the so-called simple pendulum If you're following along in the, uh, the text, uh, see you can read about this in, uh, in sections 14.5 uh, and 14.6. Uh, and in fact, everything I'll be saying here is pretty much contained in those sections, and you might, uh, you might prefer just reading them rather than listening to the, uh, to the rest of the uh, video. But, as I say, what we're now thinking about in this simple pendulum is that uh, we'll have a very light string and some point mass uh, attached down here. Uh, what makes it a simple pendulum is that it, uh, we ignore the mass of the string and we treat the, uh, the bob here as a simple point mass. Uh, but our analysis is going to be as before. We're going to do the, the good old F equals MA. Uh, let me take this pendulum and I'm going to pull it off to the side here. At some angle theta and uh, and we ask as we very often do what are the forces on this and of course as you know there's a the tension force from the string 
uh, plane upward. And there's, of course, a weight force uh, W uh, pulling downward. Well, uh, the motion of the pendulum bob, of course, is along this arc. Uh, and so what we're interested in is the, uh, the restoring force that brings it back to equilibrium. So as we've done before with the uh, circular motion, uh, we'll take the weight force and we'll resolve it into two components, uh, a component which is uh, tangent uh, to the uh, motion and the other component which is uh, radial. So we have radial and tangential components, uh, we'll call them uh, WT and, uh, and WR, uh, for example. And, uh, and you can see pretty easily that the, the angle in my force triangle up here is the same as angle theta. And so it's the work for a moment to conclude that uh, WR is equal to mg times the cosine of theta. And this tangential component WT is equal to mg times the sine of theta. And as a consequence, uh, we're now ready to write uh, the uh, F uh, equals MA. And uh, our weight force um, component in the tangential direction uh, is just going to be now minus, minus MG sine theta. And that will equal MA, where in this case, the acceleration is along the circular arc. We call that distance s, and so the acceleration is the second derivative of that arc length s squared. Now, however, we're going to do, uh, do an approximation. Uh, in our previous example with the mass and the spring, uh, the equation was exact, but uh, you'll notice that's not the case here. And instead of just plain old um, s or theta, we've got a sine. And some of you in your calculus class may have seen the power series expansion for the, uh, for the sine and know that, uh, that you can approximate it uh, as a, a series um, that starts out uh, something like this. And uh, we're going to keep just the uh, smallest member of the series. That is to say, we're going to approximate the sine of theta as if it were just theta itself. Now, if you haven't seen that power series expansion, uh, you needn't worry about it at all. Uh, you might have some fun. Um, put your calculator into the um, uh, radian mode and uh, just punch in something like the, uh, the sine of two tenths of a radian. Again, remember to make sure that's in the, uh, your calculators in the radian mode. And if you'll do that, uh, you'll find that the answer comes out to be uh, very, very close to the angle itself. In fact, uh, we're uh, something like only three quarters of 1% error in uh, using the angle theta instead of the actual proper sign. So that's what we're going to do. Our, our next step in this equation then is going to uh, write this as mg times theta as equal to m and now the second derivative of the, uh, the S. Uh, but uh, you'll remember that the arc length S, uh, for something which is going in a, uh, an arc like that, that arc length S is in fact just the radius times the angle itself. And so I can write this as the second derivative of the, uh, uh, in this case I'll call that r and, uh, and theta with respect to uh, t. Oh, but the r is going to stay constant as this swings back and forth, and so this is just mr times the second derivative of theta. So this is the equation that we'll be wanting to look at. Here is the force, a restoring force, uh, proportional to the angle. And here is the second derivative of that angle uh, that comes from the acceleration term. So let me, uh, let me give us a clean uh, slate here. you by now 
figured out, kind of improvising for uh, for a whiteboard here. But this ought to do the trick. Uh, get a little messy. Okay. So, as I say, where, where we ended up on the uh, on the last frame was saying that our uh, our expression for the force uh, can be approximated as mg uh, theta. Over on the acceleration side, we had m times the uh, r squared and the second derivative of theta with respect to t. Uh, all of which is true except. Uh, it wasn't r squared, that was just plain old r. Uh, in our last expression. So here we are, and now you can see, interestingly enough, that the uh, the mass of the uh, of the bob doesn't matter, and with a, just a little bit of rearrangement, we can convert this into the same form uh, that we had previously. Again, upside down. Uh, let's see. Bring what's up here. So let's call that g uh, over r uh, times theta. Uh, in your textbook, uh, they call this r uh, value, which remember was from the uh, uh, length of the uh, of the string uh, mass m. Uh, they call this l, and so I'm going to just convert this uh, to make it consistent with your text notation and call that uh, uh, g over l, where l is the length of the pendulum. Well, the point is, uh, we're right back uh, where we were uh, earlier, um, except that now that constant that we have in front of theta is no longer k over m, but rather is g over l. But nonetheless, we have just succeeded in determining what <coughs> omega squared is. It's the uh, whatever co uh, constant appears in front of the theta. And so now you have a new expression for the uh, angular frequency for a simple pendulum. It's the gravitational field strength uh, divided by the length of the pendulum. Uh, but you can do all the kinds of problems that um, similar to the ones that you've been working on for homework uh, when you uh, when you take the uh, <coughs> uh, and replace k over m with g over l. Uh, this is the uh, the frequency. So the frequency is uh, uh, omega over two pi, and uh, consequently you've got one over two pi of g over L square rooted, uh, and you can get the period as the reciprocal of the frequency, and well, you know how uh, this game goes on. It's all the stuff that you have already done. Um, with the spring mass system, you're now able to do with the simple pendulum system. And, uh, and you might want to uh, take a look oh, uh, in your text again. There's a series of highlighted equations. Uh, 14.32 and 33 and, uh, and 34 that contain all of the ways that you can combine the period and the frequency and so forth with this new expression uh, for, the, uh, for the frequency. And uh, it makes physical sense. We, we should stop and think about that. This says that the, uh, the longer the pendulum uh, the smaller the frequency is, and that makes sense. You've seen enough pendulum probably uh, swinging back and forth to know that the, the long ones take a long time to go back and forth, or a short one will uh, have a very short uh, uh, period. And uh, what you haven't had a chance to explore is the fact that those actually change with the gravitational field strength, uh, but in fact they do, and uh, in fact that's one way the gravitational field strength is sometimes measured. Okay, so now we know all about the uh, simple pendulum. On the, uh, on the next movie clip, uh, we'll move on to talk about the uh, so-called physical pendulum.